Hello, everybody. Well, soon. Soon, hopefully, people will join. Right now, I'm just lonely. <laughs> that was sad. I did not expect it. But it's okay. We have a viewer. Welcome. We have two viewers. Welcome to our cele to this celebration of knowledge that we have going on. God. Oh, we will start at three fifty. If you are a live viewer, if you are a not live viewer, of which there are probably none, but. It is 3.45, so you can do the math and figure out when to, you know, skip to it. Okay. Thank you for uh, for the support, Michelle Song. everyone's day has been going well it's just a bit awkward because there's only one person <laughs> one person watching but soon in a few years we're gonna have we're gonna have all of america is gonna be tuning in to my my celebrations of knowledge I hope everyone has been enjoying their summer. Summer's coming to a close, but that's okay. More time for learning in a classroom setting. Man, I've been doing this for months, but I'm still, still shooting on a potato. I hope you guys can see enough pixels to make out that it's me. But damn, the Wi-Fi in my room is not is not great. If anyone is seeing this other than Michelle Song, they should go to Michelle Song's YouTube channel and leave a very nice comment on her flute video. Just a little just a little shout out to another to another uh, fellow YouTuber. Fellow uh, famous YouTuber. <laughs> oh, Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Michelle Song is quite the mathematician herself. She qualified for the Amy her senior year. So watch out. Watch out other other math people. She's coming for you. Thank you. 
I am so sorry for being so incompetent. Okay. It is 350. That means it is math time. All right. So first let me begin by for any, you know, for anyone who hasn't, who doesn't have a lot of experience, okay? I'm gonna go through the Putnam exam, explain what it is, explain what it's about. Okay. So the Putnam exam, well, okay, for well, yeah, the Putnam exam is a notorious nationwide college math competition taken by about 4,500 undergraduate students every year. The test consists of um, 12, 12 problems. I don't know how I can, I think, I think this 12 problems. Okay. And each problem is 10 points. That one's a little easier. Each problem is 10 points. So 120 points in total. If you couldn't figure that out, you might be in the wrong place. Okay. You might want to, this, this, this might be a little complicated. Okay. Anyway, 120 points in total, and they are not nice about the partial credit. The average score, the median score over all 4,500 undergraduates, all these math nerds. Okay. Median person can only get one out of 120 or zero out of 120 some years even. Okay. So the exam is pretty brutal. Oh yeah. And it takes six hours to complete. Okay. Anyway, enough about that. Uh, the 2020 Putnam, 2021 Putnam exam will be held on December 4th, 2021. It's always the first Saturday Saturday in December, unless there was a global pandemic, in which case it was held on a random date last year, or I guess this year, actually. The 2020 Putnam was this year. Uh, now, if you are a student at Pitt, please make sure you join the Putnam Seminar. I made a very persuasive video on my YouTube channel, which hopefully persuaded you to join the class. Last year, we only had two students and I was one of them, which is just ridiculous, okay? But this year, last time I checked, we had six. So at this rate, everyone in the world is gonna be signed up by like 2070 or something, okay? So keep up the good work. Now, during the 2020 Putnam exam, I actually solved this problem, 2020 Putnam A1. And for anyone who has done high school competitions, this is a very high school-esque problem. Okay, maybe like maybe like a mid to late Amy problem. But you don't care about that. You care about the math. So let's get let's get right into the math. All right. So I have the problem pulled up. Let me explain what it's about. Let me explain what it's about. And then I'll explain how you how you could solve it. Okay. So the question is this: how many positive integers n satisfy all of the following three? conditions. Okay. Condition one, N is divisible by 20, 20. Okay. That's condition one. Condition two is N has at most, man, my handwriting has not improved since the third grade. N has at most 20, 20 decimal digits. Okay. Condition three. This is the, this, oh my God. Okay. Condition three. This is, this is the real kicker. Okay. Condition three is that the decimal digits of N are a string of consecutive ones followed by a string of consecutive zeros. So what that means is whatever n looks like, okay, the number is gonna look like one, 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 and then zero, 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 zero. Can only look like, can only look like that. All right. So um, let me pull up, let me pull up my notes. Okay, so this is the first solution that I personally solved. It's a bit more mathy and requires a little bit more background knowledge. But the second solution I will go through, it's uh, more clever and you can do it uh, without a lot of prior knowledge. Now, the first thing I thought when I was looking at this, the first thing you should think, okay, is that whenever you're given, um, you know, it, it's asking you to find, I think it's asking you to find 
how many positive integers follow these constraints. So you know you're you have like a set of numbers and they all follow these constraints. Really, what you want to pay attention to is the con the constraints that constrain the number the most. Okay. So if I told you that like I don't know, Stephen lives in Virginia, okay, and then I told you that Stephen is a is a math and CS major at the University of Pittsburgh, okay. Uh, the second condition is clearly a lot more constraining, and that's where you want to look first. That's really what's going to like, like if you know if I gave you those two conditions, you're not going to start knocking on everyone in Virginia's door looking for Stephen Art. Okay, you're going to go to University of Pittsburgh and find their math and CS major list, and you'd find me in like five seconds. Okay, so the point is when we're looking at this, we're going to look at each condition. We're going to see how much does it actually tell us. Okay, first condition tells us n is divisible by 2020. <sighs> Thank you. First condition says n is divisible by 2020. Okay. I mean, you know, that's like, okay, that's moderately constraining. You know, there's only about a 2020th of numbers is divisible by 2020. Okay. So that's, that's pretty, pretty important. Second good condition says n has at most 2020 decimal digits. Well, oh my God. Okay. There are a lot of numbers with at least 20, 20 decimal digits, okay? 10 to the 20, 20 of them, in fact. And that is really not going to tell us much, okay? And we don't really wanna start looking there first. Uh, it's going to become relevant, obviously. Obviously it's important, okay? Otherwise the answer here would be infinite, but it's not something that we're gonna focus on at the start. Now the third condition tells us that N looks like this in this very wacky way, okay? That it's a bunch of ones followed by a bunch of zeros. Condition three is clearly the most constraining condition of all, okay? Like uh, over all the possible numbers we could have, this is narrowing it, narrowing it down the most. And that's where we wanna look first for uh, more interesting information we can pull from this problem. So, uh, all right, so we know kind of uh, where we're gonna look first. Then the second thing we wanna do is think about how we can characterize this number, okay? So right now I said, oh, n equals like one, 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 dot, 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 one, one, then zero, 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 dot, dot, zero, zero. I mean, like we wanna be able to, uh, to describe this in some kind of mathy way other than just like listing out the digits because in its current form in this way, it's not that, like we can't do much analysis on it. Okay, and we don't really know what it, what this actually is, other than what it looks like. If you know what I mean, like if I said, um, well, actually, I don't really have a good example. So I think I think I'll just go through what I'm talking about, and hopefully that will become clear. Okay, so what we're gonna do? So we're gonna try to characterize. Um, characterize these kinds of numbers. So if we know it's a bunch of ones followed by a bunch of zeros, okay, then what we'll do is we'll say, let's say it has A ones and B zeros. Okay, A ones and B zeros. Now, um, the first thing that you wanna realize is that if I'm trying to describe this number better, you know, more mathematically, okay, all these zeros followed at the end is going to turn into a power of 10 to the B, okay? So if I have a number like 9, and then I multiply it by, uh, and then I, and I look at the number 900, 900 is 9 times 10 to the 2, 10 squared, right? Every time you multiply by 10, you get an extra power of 10, and it adds a 0 on the end. So we can rewrite n as 10 to the b times, and then this number with all the ones, with a ones. Okay, so from this point, that's unfortunate, there's no one watching, but that's okay, it's okay. From this point, what we're gonna wanna do is, um, is characterize this number, okay? So, now this one's this one's more tricky, obviously. Okay, because if we had just a one followed by a bunch of zeros, we know how to do that. We know how to represent that. 
this number is um, a bit weirder. Okay. Now, this is one of those points in a Putnam problem. Okay. Whenever you're solving a Putnam problem, usually there's a couple of big roadblocks that you have to get over. Okay. And this is one of those big roadblocks. Uh, you have to, or you have to make like a couple key insights. All right. To, um, to get, to get over that hurdle. And so a lot of times when you look at a Putnam problem solution, it's not that it's super long. It's actually that it just makes, you know, three, two, three, or four, um, clever insights. And this is one of them. Okay. Now the clever insight here is at least what I thought. Well, first thing I thought was where have I seen this before? Where have I seen a bunch of ones before in any math situation? Okay. Obviously, uh, I got to do a big search there in my brain. But what I realized was that I've seen repeating ones before in uh, the decimal expansion of one ninth. Like that. Okay, well, it goes on forever. That's where I've seen repeating ones before. And then I thought, um, and really, again, what I'm trying to do is be, try, I'm trying to write this number. Uh, I'm trying to express this number like as, um, as something I can calculate, right? And then I remembered, uh, if you've ever seen the, the proof, okay, that... If you ever seen the proof that 0.99 repeating is equal to one, okay, this is a famous, famous proof. All right. Usually what they'll do is they'll say something like one ninth equals 0.1 repeating. And then if you multiply by nine, you get nine over nine equals 0.9 repeating. And nine over nine simplifies to one. And you get, you get this, this result. So with these two, uh, things in mind. Okay. This is at least what I noticed. Um, what I realized was that if I take my number one, all these A's or a ones, and I multiply it by nine, then I get a bunch of nines, a nines. And this number is actually describable. Okay. As Think about it, okay, as 10 to the A minus 1, okay? So this is this number equals a 1 followed by A zeros, okay, because it's A digits, and this is a 1 followed by A zeros, and then minus 1, and that's going to give us all these 9s, okay? And the 1 followed by A zeros is 10 to the A, okay? So what we've done here is what we've done here is shown or at least figured out that one followed by a bunch of a's or one one a times okay this number is equal to nine a times divided by nine okay which is equal to 10 to the a minus one divided by nine. Okay. This is a, this is one of the uh, important insights to make with this problem. All right. So with that, we've turned this very bizarre and not help, not really that helpful definition of a number. And we've turned it into 10 to the or 10 to the b, okay, which is this part, times 10 to the a minus 1 over 9. Okay, we've been, we've been able to describe, we've been able to basically make a formula for how you could generate one of these numbers. All right. Now from here, the next thing I, I uh, thought of was um, the next thing I realized was the first condition says that n is divisible by 2020. So, and here, you know, we have, uh, we have 
factors. N is represented as a, as a product of two factors. And normally when, uh, actually in pretty much every situation, when you're told that a number is like N is divisible by 2020, you want to look at the prime factors of 2020 because uh, N being divisible by 2020 is really saying N is divisible by two squared and five and 101, which is the prime factorization. So if 2020 divides N, okay, that's the symbol for that. Then we know that four divides N, we know five divides N, and we know 101 divides N, okay? Next thing is that when you have a, if, if N is represented as a product of these two numbers, okay? Like, uh, for example, um, actually, let me look at a, let me think about, okay, yeah. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to go through each of these, okay? And we're going to see what has to be true about A and B in order to make these true, okay? So first thing, 4 divides into N. What must be true about A and B, okay? Or what we, and then we, we usually want to think about the number in general, okay? Now, if this number, a bunch of 1s followed by a bunch of zeros, is divisible by 4, then it needs to be the case that it has at least two zeros on the end, okay? If it had only one zero on the end, okay? So if you had a number like, uh, so because if it has two zeros on the end, then it's divisible by a hundred and thus it's divisible by four, okay? So as long as, long as it has at least two on the end, then we know that 100 divides into n, and so 4 will divide into n, because 100 is divisible by 4. Um, if it has only one zero, then it's only going to have one power of 2 in its prime factorization, okay? Like if I had uh, the number 1,110 divided by 2 is going to equal um, 554. Five, and we need two, we need two powers of two in order for something to be divisible by four, right? So four divides into n. This is telling us b is greater than or equal to two. Okay. Now five dividing into n. This one is a uh, five dividing into n. This one is is really easy to do, right? Because if we look at our number, okay. As long as it has at least one zero on the end, it's going to be divisible by 10 and thus by 5, right? So 5 dividing into n is just telling us that b is greater than or equal to 1. We need at least one zero on the end. And of course, that's kind of redundant with the previous one. But uh, when you're solving this, you would, you would go through each of these. The last one is, a, is the trickiest. And this is, again, where we're going to – this is a big uh, – hurdle in the problem to get over, okay? 101 divides n. That one's a bit weird. So what we're going to do for that one is we're going to take a look at the formula that we got. First thing to notice is that if 101 divides n, well, 101 is prime. So 101 either has to divide this one or this one, okay? If n was... Uh, Let's say n is, um, I don't know, 72, and we write it as 8 times 9. And then I tell you 2 divides n, then either 2 has to divide 8 or 2 has to divide 9, right? That prime factor has to be in, in one of them. Uh, so we know 101 has to either divide this term or this term. Now, this is just a power of 10, okay? 101 cannot divide power of 10. So we know that 101 has to divide this number. And what we want to do is figure out for what values of A is that true? So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna erase this. So for what values of A does 101 divide into 10 to the A minus one divided by nine? Okay. This is a oh. 
there's a glare, but here, I'll fix it. Okay. So, um, all right. So when does this happen? With this, to figure out this, we're going to use modular arithmetic. Okay. So uh, the first thing, first thing we can do is it's saying that 101 divides this number divided by 9. Now, because 9 and 101 share no prime factors, if 101 divides this number divided by 9, it's going to have to divide this number in the top. Okay. Because all that, like, all that this is saying really is that, like, um, let me go, let me go in depth with, the, with this. So we know that this number in the top is nine times this whole thing. It has an extra factor of nine. Okay. And that extra factor of nine is not going to affect its divisibility by 101. Okay. So like if, uh, I guess I should use examples. If I said 101 divides 909 divided by nine. Okay. Then like me taking out the nine from that top number is not going to change the fact that it's like, it needs to still have a hundred, a 101 in it. Again, I know uh, if, if you haven't seen this before, um, this, this, this line of reasoning with divisibility, I understand that it's complicated. I would recommend that you really practice with it because um, uh, it comes up a lot and you want to make sure that you're, you're fluent, you're fluent with it. So 101 divides 10 to the A minus 1 over 9. So then 101 must divide 10 to the A minus 1. That's an equivalent problem to solve. And we can reframe this by using modular arithmetic. So what we can say is that 10 to the A is congruent to 1 mod 101. Okay. One of the reasons this is useful is because um, this uh, we can apply a famous theorem called Fermat's Little Theorem. Okay, kind of a funny name, but Fermat's Little Theorem, which has to do with uh, powers of numbers being congruent to one mod a prime number. Okay, now if you haven't heard of this theorem, obviously you would not see this, and I would recommend that you learn it if you are into math competitions and stuff because it comes up a lot. Okay. So one of the reasons I simplified to this form was because I recognized I could apply it, apply the theorem. Whenever you have stuff mod one, whenever you have stuff congruent to one mod, a number, and then there's like a power going on, you're going to want to use Fermat's little theorem or Euler's theorem, which is the generalization. What Fermat's little theorem says is that if you have a number a, Okay, then a to the p minus one, where p is a prime number, is going to be congruent to one mod p, so long as a is not divisible by p. So uh, a couple. Let me use a few examples, okay? Because the formula isn't isn't uh, too useful, like for understanding the, the idea. If we take, if we look at um, let's say P equals five. Okay. Oops. P is five. Interestingly enough, one to the fourth is congruent to one mod five. Two to the fourth, which is 16, is congruent to one mod five. Three to the fourth, which is 81, is congruent to one mod five. And four to the fourth, which is um, 256 is also congruent to one mod five. Okay. So whenever you have a prime number, any other number that's not divisible by the prime number two P minus one will always be one mod five. If you don't believe me, test out numbers yourself. There is a proof of this that you can find online. I'm not going to go through the proof because I don't think it's particularly insightful. 2020. Yes. 2020. <laughs> All right. So with that diversion, let's apply the idea of the theorem. 
101 is a prime number. So by the theorem, we know that 10 to the 100th power is congruent to 1 mod 101. Like I said, you really need to know the theorem to, to kind of know this. Okay, like obviously you wouldn't multiply 10 out 100 times to get this. So that is the application of the theorem. Now, one of the intuitive consequences of this, it, this, is a, this is a big result in modular arithmetic, okay? So, so uh, hold your seats, okay? Because this is, this is exciting stuff. One of the big results is that um, whenever you're multi, and this will always happen, always. If you're ever looking at powers of a number, mod another number, so the remainders. Okay, so let me use an example. Let's say, uh, let's say I looked at three to the zero, three to the one, three to the two, three to the three, three to the four, mod five. Okay, I looked at all of these these remainders. The remainders are always going to eventually cycle. Okay, the reason they have to cycle is because um, if I look mod five, the only possible candidates for like what a, a number's remainder could be mod five is zero, one, two, three, and Zero, one, two, three, and four. There are only five possible numbers. And so if I do a bunch of these powers in a sequence, I multiply by three, then once I'm gonna eventually have to hit, get the same number twice, okay? And once I get the same number twice, the next numbers will always be the same because I'm always performing the same action, which is multiplying by three, okay? So big idea. What this is saying is that if we take the powers of 10, mod 101, it's going to cycle every 100. Okay, so every 100 numbers, uh, every 100 powers, there's going to be this big cycle. Okay. Now, what it doesn't tell us, though, see, the cycle could be smaller. Okay, just saying it cycles every 100, but it could cycle also every 50. Okay, it could cycle every 50. And then by extension, it would also cycle every 100, right? So what this is telling us is that the cycle is either 100 or some divisor of 100, okay? Cycle could be 50, could be 25, could be 10, could be 20, okay? Could be any of these divisors. And we need to check these divisors. Um, and we want to find the smallest one, okay? You want to find the smallest, because that's like what you actually usually refer to as the cycle. And I believe... I'm not sure what the math technical term is for a cycle. I think it's like order maybe, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Anyway, who cares about the details, all right? So what you want to do, so like, so let's say you want to know if 10 to the 50 is a cycle. Well, like, okay, obviously you can't just like, oh, let me do 10 to the 50 and do 101 into that and let me see. No, okay, that's a bad way to check. That's a lot of extra work. What you want to do is you want to start checking from the smallest numbers and then continually work your way up. Because once you find the smallest cycle, you don't have to check all the big numbers. All right. So first, uh, if it cycles every 100, it could cycle every 1. Okay. So 10 to the 1. Is that congruent to 1 mod 101? No. Okay. It's congruent to 10. So 1 is not cycle. What about 10 squared? This is 100 mod 101. Okay. No. But, okay. What should make you excited about this, all right, is that 10 squared, and again, see, this is something that, like, if you've seen this situation before many times, then you would, you would kind of notice this. If you've just seen this for the first time, it's fine if you wouldn't. But 10, uh, if, you ever get, if it's 100 mod 101, then you could also rewrite this as minus 1 mod 101. And that means that 10 to the fourth, which is minus one squared, is gonna be congruent to minus one squared or one mod 101, okay? Now, actually, I may have just overcomplicated it because what you could also do is after you check two, the next thing you're gonna check is four anyway because that's the next smallest divisor of 100. And 10 to the fourth equals 10,000. Okay. And I believe, and I believe this is congruent to one mod 101. You could just figure this out doing the division because 
9999 is equal to 90 times 101, I think. Okay, so what this is telling us is that this cycle, okay, of the powers of 10 mod 101 is every four. That's the cycle. Let's go look, let's look back at what the uh, original, what we were first looking at. So what we're first looking at is we wanted to figure out what values of A does 10 to the A is 10 to the A congruent to mod 101. Okay. Now we know that this is going to cycle every four. So what that's telling us is that A could be four. Okay. A could also be eight. Uh, it could also be 12. It could also be 16, right? You get the idea. Basically, with, if this is cycling every four, then A has to be divisible by four, okay? A has to be divisible by four. And you can get that by saying like, okay, 10 to the 16, or let me look at like 10 to the 20. That's going to be 10 to the four to the five, all right? And this inner part is going to be congruent to one, and then we just get a one to the fifth. All right, so that's big. All right, this is big news, okay? So what we've done is we successfully, so, so what, we, what we have is we have 20, 20 divides N. That's telling us that four divides uh, N, five divides N, and 101 divides N, okay? This looks like a, Weird 16, all right? So the four dividing N, oh my God, is telling us that B is greater than or equal to two. Then the five is gonna tell us that B is greater than or equal to one. Not really helpful, but you know, at least it didn't make things more complicated, right? And this 101 condition is going to actually turn into four divides into A. A is a multiple of four, okay? Lastly, so we've, we've figured out how to fully describe condition three and condition one. Lastly, we need to incorporate condition two, which is the condition saying that N is at most 20, 20 decimal digits. Because we're representing N as A ones and B zeros, that just turns into A plus B is less than or equal to 2020. The total number of digits is less than or equal to 2020. Let me write this. And this is really the kind of the crux of the problem. So at this point, now we've turned uh, the problem into a, a pretty basic counting problem where all we're trying to do is figure out the values of A and B that satisfy these four conditions. How many values of A and B satisfy, satisfy these conditions? Okay, um, because if we if you give you know once you pick an A and B that completely determines what the number N is because it's A ones followed by B zeros. Okay, so we we kind of reframed the context of the problem to something more manageable. Okay, and that is a very common common strategy that you will you will employ, hopefully effectively. All right, so now let's finish out the problem. I say this is basic. Uh, that's of course relative. Okay, that's relative to the Putnam exam. All right, uh, if, if you, um, this is a, a counting problem you may do, a, this might be a challenging counting problem you might do in like a normal uh, basic discrete structures or discrete math class. But for the Putnam, you should already, you should already be on your, you know, your A game or whatever, and you should know how to do this. So first thing, this here, uh, this condition is really going to, this is going to constrain the size of A and B. Then, okay, so first thing, we know that this is useless. All right, so we'll get rid of it. Next thing, 4 divides A. So what we'll do is we'll write A equal to 4C. Okay, so we're, we're basically encoding that piece of information into, we're gonna just rewrite A as 4C and we're just encoding this information into the other conditions, okay? So we're gonna say A is 4C and then we can reduce this problem to 
4C plus B is less than or equal to 20, 20, and B is greater than or equal to 2. Okay. Next. Okay, so what we did was just we just encoded the four divides A information into these other two, into these conditions. Next thing we'll do is um, we're gonna go through all the possible values of C, and then we're gonna think how many possible values are there of B. We're just gonna uh, we're gonna count all of them. Okay. So if C were equal to uh, now, again, a so a equals four c, okay. Now remember, um, n has to be a positive integer, so a has to be at least one, meaning a has to be at least four, okay, uh, because otherwise it would just be n would just be zero, right? It'd just be a bunch of zeros. So you know c is at least one. So if c is one, then we have the condition b is between two and 2016, okay? If C is two, B is gonna be between two and 2012. If C is three, B is gonna be between two and 2008. And the number of numbers, so for this range, two to 200, 2016, there are 2015 numbers in that range. Everything one, two, three, four, up to 2016, but we're not counting one, right? So there's 2015 numbers in this range, all right? There's 2011 numbers in this range, There's and there's 2007 numbers in this range, okay? So the pattern, hopefully you can see the pattern, okay? Just decreasing by four every time, and it's gonna turn into a really big arithmetic series. The arithmetic series is going to, well, okay. So we know 2015 and then 2011, 2007. So the first number is actually going to be three, okay? Because uh, 2015 is three more than a multiple of, wait, hold up. Yeah, I think so. Because 2015 is a uh, multiple, is three more than a multiple of four. So you get three. So this is these are counting all of the possibilities for B and C. 3, 7, 11, up to um, 2011, and then 2015. I hope I'm doing this right. Um, yeah, pretty sure this is right. Okay, and then um, we want to add this up. So arithmetic series, okay? Get your Algebra 2 hat on, okay? You should remember this. So what you want to do is take the average of the first and last terms and multiply by the number of terms. The average of the first and last terms is that times, and then how many terms are in the sequence? Well, it's the same as the number of terms in the sequence 5, 8, 12, up to 2016, which is the same as 1, 2, 3, up to 504. Man, I really rushed that, didn't I? So this is counting terms in a sequence. So what we did was we added one to every number. That's not gonna change the number of terms in the sequence. Four, eight, 12, up to 2016. And then, then divide all the terms by four. That's not gonna change the number of terms in the sequence. Sequence becomes one, two, three, up to 504. So there are 504 numbers in this series. Okay. Times 504. I'm sure there's some other like, there's, I believe there's some other way you could do this. Okay, um, using the arithmetic series, the terms of the, like, I'm sure there's other ways, other ways you can do that. Um, don't focus too much on my details. But finally, finally, we obtain that the number we are looking for is 1009 times 504. That is the number of positive integers which satisfy the three conditions of the problem. So um, now then you could multiply this out, okay? And give uh, give the, the it's like 524,000 something, all right? Uh, but I also wrote it in this factorized form on the test because like 
they're not going to, they probably wouldn't dock you points if you didn't do this multiplication. I think they're confident that you're able to do this. Okay. All right. So that is my solution to this problem. I will briefly touch on another alternate solution you could use without using Fermat's little theorem. So you can obtain the realization that four needs to divide into A by casework, okay? So, eventually, so testing numbers for N and eventually realizing that this number, um, yeah, that one, 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 one is divisible by 101 and it's 11 times 101, okay? Uh, yeah. So if you had, all right, let's say I had the number with, and, and furthermore, one, 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 and one, they're not divisible by 101. So A equals to four is the first number that's going to work. Okay. Now let's say we had some number. Let's say we had a number that was five ones. Okay. 11,111. Then we could rewrite this. Now we know this chunk is divisible by 101. So we need So this is divisible. So we need this to be divisible by 101. But that's not, you know, 10,000 is not divisible by 101, okay? So if we had 5 once, then a equal to 5 does not work, okay? Let's say we had a equal to 6. Again, same logic. All right? Because we know that again, we know that this, this front part is not divisible by 101 and all of these zeros, the extra factor of extra factors of 10 are not going to help either. Lastly. Okay. Well, not really lastly, but eventually the realization that you want to make is that, so let's say we had eight ones. All right. If we had eight, then we would have, then we would have this divisible by 1,111, and this would also be divisible by 1,111, okay? Because we have the four in the front. So A equal to four and A equal to eight, those are, those are good candidates and they work. And you can explain, you know, using similar logic to what I was saying, you can explain why only powers of four, multiples of four will work because you could say, assume that this number is not have multiple four, does not have A being a multiple of four, then, um, it would turn into a, like, so you say, assume that this number has a, a not a multiple of four, then you would say, okay, uh, take off, you know, all of the ones on the end, a multiple of four number of ones off the end. Okay, shave them all off. You know that that resultant number is divisible by four or by 101. And then the remaining chunk, which would be like, one, one, and then followed by a bunch of zeros or one, 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 followed by a bunch of zeros. This remaining chunk uh, would not be divisible by 101. Lots of ones flying around, okay? If that line of reasoning didn't make sense, there's a couple approaches you could take, okay? I would recommend that you, uh, you try it out for yourself, okay? This is the kind of thing where you wanna play with it a bit and, and see uh, un until it makes sense. Or, I, I personally would recommend that you employ the first solution using Fermat's little theorem, just because it's more rigorous. Uh, it's easier to write in a proof. And if you're taking the Putnam exam, you absolutely should know Fermat's little theorem anyway. Okay. So make sure that, that you learn that. Okay. So, Um, okay. So thank you to everyone who came today, or if you didn't come, it's fine. Thank you to everyone who watched this, or if you didn't watch it, that's fine too. Okay. Um, so this problem, like I said, uh, I guess, you know, looking around, um, online, this problem is considered to be a, an easier 
like a one Putnam problem. Okay. Obviously it's, so this is a one. So it's the easiest problem on the exam. And I, I'm pretty sure I, I can say that pretty objectively considering last year's exam. But some people would even say, a lot of people would even say that this is, this is an easier compared to relative years. This is, this is a, an easy, easiest problem. Okay. Uh, now that should not discourage you. Okay. Because like I said, on most years, most people do not solve the first problem. Okay. The easiest problem. And most people taking this test, if they already have the, the wherewithal, okay. To sit down for eight hours on a, on a Saturday after they've taken all their finals and are probably brain dead. If they have the wherewithal to do that, they're already going to be good math students anyway. So if you weren't able to follow this or you didn't solve this, like that's totally fine. Okay. Most people are in your shoes. And if you are able to solve this, that already puts you ahead of most people. So keep up the good work. Okay. All right. So, um, now next week I will be going back to campus. I'm not sure how many of these streams I'll be doing. I might do some kind of corny ones. Okay. Uh, but, um, this whiteboard is in my house attached to my wall. Um, I might get, I might get another one for college. So I may or may not be doing more of these streams, but if not, again, if you're a student at the university of Pittsburgh, join the Putnam seminar. Otherwise, good luck on the Putnam exam. Good luck on your next semester of classes or, you know, whatever. And, um, make sure to smash like and subscribe as, al as always.